Hello, um, I'm Jimmy Shaw. I work with uh, McAfee uh, and mobile security solutions or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my thing is uh, mobile devices, tiny devices, anything smaller than a car, if it has a microprocessor in it, we deal with it, or at least the threats to it. Um, who we are, um, whoa, did I skip a step? <laughs> okay, I, I'm, we're mobile antivirus researchers. We deal with uh, threats to device like uh, malware, viruses, trojans, the whole nine yards. Work with a team of people in globally located uh, parts of Asia, Asia parts of uh, in America, yeah, around. We're, we, we are never sleeping or something like that. <laughs> uh, so we specialize in pretty much every platform. If you have something new coming out, we're probably looking at it also. And uh, we work with a bunch of mobile uh, carriers and, and manufacturers and pretty much anything in the mobile space, we're, we're tied up with that. Okay, uh, let's go quickly through this uh, first few slides. Uh, we're currently seeing about 1,200 uh, different variants of mobile malware. Uh, the pie chart's a good way of showing you this, the layout of overall what we have seen. Uh, the big slice is Symbian. Symbian, which was, was now nearly gone with uh, many backers pulling out, but it, at a, for a certain time, it was pretty much the largest affected platform period, followed closely by mobile Java and then the new and upcomer of Android, which is similar but not quite mobile Java. And actually, if you look at our quarterly stats, we're actually seeing Android creeping up on jo uh, mobile Java and the Symbian falling down, and I think the most current new malware we're seeing is all Android. So we'll, see, we'll be seeing more of those at the end. Um, let's take a quick look at historical for-profit malware. Uh, for-profit malware would be, the first one pretty much was Java Red Browser A, which was a a fake uh, web browser, and it, uh, it, it, it pretended to be a WAP browser, so okay, you over SMS. So it, it was a Trojan, and it put a lot of effort into fooling you, thinking, yeah, okay, we'll send an SMS out there, or, uh, and we'll be able to browse the internet, and it'll be cheaper than using a data plan. Nice, didn't do that. I'll just uh, send out a bunch of messages to a bunch of uh, a Russian uh, SMS uh, premier mate uh, services. And then it was followed quickly by Wesber, which didn't even try any of the techniques used by Red Browser, and uh, uh, it was just a, like a mugging, really. And those were the first ones. Uh, the first few we ever saw them was about four or five years ago. Uh, what we see generally with uh, mobile malware, and pretty much mobile malware on any platform, is, is sort of a life cycle of how it goes. Uh, the first stage is the uh, R&D stage, where we have people like uh, virus zine writers, uh, other, other uh, hackers, perhaps, or uh, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> security researchers uh, looking into making proof of concepts and putting them together and, and writing tutorials, putting out uh, papers, putting out presentations, teaching people how to deal with the platform, how to figure out what APIs to use, figure out what we're doing with it or what people are doing with it. Um, that's followed relatively shortly after you get the first big rush of people by, did we use, uh, not to cycle, so I guess whatever you want to call that. Next stage, um, you'll notice all the bugs are very similar, but they look a little, little different. They're, it, well, they're cosmetically different in that they have different colors. That tends to happen quite a bit with, with malware. Once people have gotten through the whole, what APIs do we use? What can we pull off on the platform? Why don't we just reuse the code and just change the strings or something? That, that's what usually happens. After those two stages are done, though, it's where, what this talk is actually about. How do people make money once they decided to go into malware? Like, what do we do next? We've done the creative part, we've done all the, uh, the uh, repetitive part and the, uh, the copycat stuff. How do we actually put money in our wallets? And that's really what the rest of it's gonna be. Um, let's look at modern more for-profit malware where you're actually here. Um, here are your trends by a geographical region. Uh, you'll see the map here. We have rough regions like North America and South America and Africa, uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia. Australia. Uh, we haven't really seen a lot of mobile malware coming out of America. We are, we're suspecting that that might be because we have so many ways to make money legitimately, maybe? Eh, could be. Uh, we have the app stores where you can sell your apps there and make a, make a lot of money. Okay, we can sell, make a fart app and make them sell it for like what? I don't know, a buck now? I mean, they've actually driven the price down from whatever it was, like 25 bucks and, or 10 bucks, or if you bought that app, what was it? Uh, I'm rich bitch for like 9,999, whatever the top limit is on the App Store, Apple App Store. I think they sold about two copies because people thought it was a joke, but they didn't read the EULA. What was that? I'm a human uh, centipede, <laughs> South Park. Yeah, read, read the EULA or you get stuck, apparently. Uh, so we don't see a lot in, in, in America and not too much in South America. 
we're not sure why exactly, but it, we're, and not too much in Africa. Part of, the, part of this in the other parts of the world, outside of North America, is that it's not as profitable to have, have uh, or to purchase a smartphone. It's, it's a really large part of your income, and if you're not likely to have one, you're probably going to have a, like a, you know, a feature phone that just runs Java and maybe a couple MP3s or video files. Something simple. So we pull them out of the mix, the geographical region, uh, and we end up with basically uh, East, uh, Western Europe where we saw maybe one or two things. And that's actually tied to Australia where we saw the IQ worm. Um, we, we call it, uh, at Maccabee, we call that uh, OSX uh, slash uh, rroll.a through C. Uh, so the first two versions, the Y3 variants, uh, the first two versions were by the guy Ashley Towns, uh, Ike, or Ikex, I, I forget what his handle is. Uh, he he wrote, wrote this worm for jailbroken iPhones, and it, it, it basically replaced the background and moved to Rick Astley. So it's like, yeah, all right, awesome. So you're going after all this, and he, he managed to release source code, source code for those two uh, worms, and at the same time, or a little bit after, he got picked up... Uh, as a legitimate uh, app, app developer. He got a real job out of writing uh, mobile malware or a worm. But uh, the key point of that is how that ties into Europe is that the next variant turned into, someone actually tried to turn that into something that actually makes the money directly from the app or from the worm. <laughs> Which is like, instead of just doing the, uh, uh, the worm, <laughs> I just replaced it with her casting and does a bunch of nonsense. The next step turned into, a, it was a phishing worm. It was the uh, RLC, some people call it IKB. Um, Basically, it was two pieces. It, it, one was a downloader script, and one was uh, it was a part, it was basically the propagation portion of the of the original Rickrolling worm to like push it out to every jailbreak broken iPhone and get it out there. And uh, a different part that what tempted uh, we've seen all the, if you've seen all the analysis, it said oh it sends SMS does this does that whatever. All it really did was add a new host file to to, to uh, replace uh, a, a local uh, European banking uh, website with uh, that of uh, a server under control of the attacker. So a CNC server is somewhere in a different location, and it, you basically you go to your website, you get shipped to them, and they, they take your money. Which is kind of nice for the attacker, not for anyone else. Uh, that was also closed down pretty quickly because it was pretty obvious what they were doing. Banks shut down quickly. So we kind of move on from them. We move on to basically uh, what's left. Because we don't see, outside of those jailbroken phones, we don't see much on any other real phones. Or regular phones, say an Android phone or Windows Mobile, yeah, or pretty much anything like that, any other option, or WebOS or anything else. What we're really seeing is that there are basically two regions, places that there are Russian-speaking areas and Chinese-speaking areas, pretty much, and it splits into basically, uh, okay, we got, a, we got about a, a hundred odd variants from the uh, Russian-speaking areas, and about 200 plus, all nearly doubled, pretty much, coming out of, out of the Chinese-speaking areas. And, and it's, it's, the interesting part is what the differences are between them. Uh, if you're looking at the Russian-speaking areas, you, you figure Russia's known for a lot of very complex malware and whatnot, especially on the PC. On the mobile side, they've got really simple Java, Java Trojans and SMS sending Trojans. Like, that's basically the bare, bare, simple, easiest possible thing you could ever, ever do. Okay, hey, let's send an SMS. That's it. That's all they do. That's like Westberg, just like the mugging, just like the uh, red browser in the beginning, that's the four-year-old or five-year-old uh, technique. That's all they're doing. They haven't changed that in about five years. They changed into the strings, the names, whatever. Still the same. The other versions we're seeing, uh, or at least the variety we're seeing in the Chinese-speaking areas, we've got multiple platforms. Oh, actually, let me go back there to the Russian areas. Android is, is programmed in Java, and it gets converted to a, a different format, a different bytecode. But basically, uh, on the developer side, it's almost the same thing. So it would have been very simple for, their, for uh, a Russian uh, mobile malware developer to just say, OK, let me port my code over to Android. Change a few libraries, and you're pretty much done. We compile, boom. All the, all, all the same things. Uh, if you're dealing with, with the, uh, the Chinese-speaking areas, they're a little more complex. The environment's a little bit more complex. One, you've got, a, got a, like a millions of users. Uh, two, you've got people doing uh, multiple platforms, Symbian, Android, whatnot. And I'll be covering most of these things in a little bit later uh, with the actual pictures. The, the, the key trend, though, is that it's a lot more complex in, in those areas, and there's a lot more competition. And the competition helps to drive more of the complexity. So instead of just having, OK, I don't know, uh, a simple Trojan, you're having things that go after other either security software or, or going after other malware writers, other people trying to make money writing, uh, writing basic mobile Trojans or mobile uh, complicated malware, meaning botnets, meaning uh, what else we got out there, <laughs> rootkits, pretty much any technique you, you can use on, on another platform, they're, they're porting it to, to, to the, the mobile side just so they can keep in business. Uh, let's go on to actually uh, how do they make money. 
Uh, how do you make pro uh, any kind of money if you're trying to make uh, money with mobile malware? Uh, you've, you've, the common way is uh, write it yourself, sell to somebody else, uh, which is kind of a thing that happened with Zitmo, where uh, the first few versions were basically repurposed uh, original malware sold to, or stole, sold, stolen, whatever, I'm not sure exact numbers, from the original author and turned into a way to make money for, for, for larger crime syndicates. And distribution basically would be you just put it out there, get your stuff out there, get it on a site, uh, freeware site, uh, download site, put it to be something else, something like that. I mean, that's, that's kind of that part. But where's, where's the actual money coming from? Uh, one thing is premium rate numbers. This is your downloads, your, your ringtones, pretty much any way to make money doing this. You know, you say, okay, or actually, how do I get some way to take money out of your, your user's wallet, put it in my wallet? And uh, there are also sub subscription services, so you sign up once with a premium rate message and it continually bills you over and over again. Which is nice uh, for the attacker, once again. Not for us. Uh, where's the money again? Uh, other ways to make money. So say you don't want to be so, so deliberate and so obvious, like taking the money straight out, okay, like those old 900 numbers and whatnot and, and premium rate and uh, telephone numbers, toll fraud they call it in the, in the tele telecom industry. Basically, you sign somebody else up for, for one of our services and it's very obvious because the billing is directed to the, to the device. The other option is basically another thing from the PC side, click fraud. Ad networks, uh, black ad SEO, things like that. I mean, you're driving traffic towards somewhere to, or, or trying to pretend to, to uh, make money off somebody. What was the deal with the uh, click fraud is basically you have, uh, you have ads and uh, they have fraud detection techniques in place, so if you have like the same guy clicking about 100,000 times, that's gonna get uh, tagged. If you get him clicking about 20 times, it's probably gonna get tagged. I forget the exact threshold. It's pretty low, I think, for unique uh, individuals or whatnot. So in this case, if you're an attacker and you wanna make a bunch of money, you just put out something like a botnet and say, okay, I'm gonna take over a bunch of different uh, mobile devices, so I've got a, tons of different IPs, and it's all individual users and all looks legitimately like real traffic. It's, so it's a slow thing, but it's a lot of people. It's, I've, it's been described to me as a, um, and I've described it also <laughs> as, as basically, you've got about a, you got, uh, you're sitting like a dollar from about a million people. That's a pretty good, good haul. That's always this. And also, um, you can also do it the other way offensively against someone else's ad network and say, okay, take out my competitors and just click on all their ads and wipe them out. Take out their entire budget and take them out. And uh, the next stage is, uh, personal identifiable information, which should be uh, your, your, uh, your social security number, some other identifying number, maybe your identifying number of your device, uh, something else that they can use to, to tell directly who you are, which is useful for various reasons. I mean, you can, it could also be account numbers, like, like a Skype account or something, or a, a chat account. The, the key is you can take that kind of information, which is valuable to, to uh, identity thieves and other people, marketers, legit, legitimately to marketers, and, and, and not so much to basically people who would take that and turn into a currency as identity theft. Um, and they will just resell it in bulk or individually, or use it individually. Uh, once again, the next one is uh, phishing. Phishing. Um, this was similar to the earlier thing I mentioned, the, the worm, that, the iPhone jailbreak worm that replaced the website. Not as popular in, in, in Europe and in, in North America, well, not at all in North America, uh, but in, it is in quite, quite so in, in China, where, which I saw a talk earlier today, if you anyone seen that talk yesterday with you know, the uh, phishing going on in China, banks are a big target and it's really useful to go after something like that. And also you can download additional malware, maybe spyware and get a few more details or other accounts. It's very useful. Um, which is similar to the next slide, really it's, if you have an account like a QQ account, or which is a very popular uh, Chinese uh, instant messaging platform, if, if you're not aware, um, and it has, you, you're able to cash out money. You can trade it, trade QQ coins on on the network and cash it out at various third-party uh, vendors, which is really a black market because it's, it wasn't uh, legal basically to cash out the QQ coins. So there will always be some third party, and they will take their cuts, and you will be dealing with organized crime. Very useful. And also, there are, if you're in the business of stealing people's legitimate accounts, there are also money launderers and people who help you clean that money out for you. So you'd sell to them and go through that. Uh, now let's actually look at uh, how they avoid detection and how analysis and may make uh, our job a little harder. Uh, what happens? Okay, uh, injecting the code into clean apps. We haven't seen file infectors in mobile platforms at all, possibly because we're using Java, but really because no one's trying or no one has to try. 
Uh, so what would you do? You'd inject your code into something like a lj 2 me app, very easy to compile, add your code into it, recompile, very simple. Uh, Symbian, a little harder, more likely Trojans or whatnot, but it's, it's been done, put into like an IM app, someone's invaded in a real IM app and said, okay, repackage it and send it back out. A little harder to do, but they've done it. Uh, Android, it's more like things like uh, Droid Dream and a few other major malware families that are really done manually. We haven't seen any evidence it's been automated. You may, we, we'd otherwise you'd be seeing thousands of apps, given that the Android market itself is very open and the other markets are also, uh, uh, well, the third party markets are completely open. So it would be really, really easy to target a certain segment of market and just flood all the apps in store with uh, corrupted apps, which we haven't seen. We've seen relatively small numbers, uh, 40, 50, 30, whatever, small enough that, that a single person could do it overnight or something, could basically produce it or on their, on their off time they can put it together. Um, what's been used to evade detection? Encryption. Uh, it ranges from simple to advanced. In a simple range, we've got things like hiding SMS within, let's say, an HTML file. Like, a, really, if it's like a standard, uh, standard HTML file on your system, in your data directory or in your browser directory, you're not going to notice. And if it's J2ME, we found this in J2ME Trojan, you're really not going to notice unless you're, you're, you're having an analyst look at it and we'd see it. And we'd say, okay, well, where is it? Not too hard. It's actually a little dark section right there. Very simple. They actually put the SMS in the message and then they assume no one's looking at it. Truthfully, if you're a regular user, you're not going to notice it. Um, then they stepped that game up a little bit by doing s another simple technique, uh, simple substitution cipher. Say, okay, we replace digits with like letters or something or uh, different digits or whatever it takes. Just really simple and just putting into the code so you have like an encrypted configuration file. Once again, not for the average user or the victim, but for analysts. Um, then we went a little step further. We were a little more complex, a little more sensible. They went with like standard ciphers, like DES. Uh, I forget exactly what the thing was. Yeah, Android Ganymede. This was the, one of the first ones to actually encrypt uh, both the uh, URLs that, uh, that it sends the data to, or that it posts URLs to the, to the command and control server, and also traffic that it's getting back from, from the command and control server. So it's like, which is great. It's symmetric cipher, very, relatively secure. Uh, but once again, not to protect uh, or, or hide from, from analysts who would have an access to binary and have access to the actual uh, key. I mean, it's, in, it's in, in there already. You can just pick out the key. You have a symmetric server. You have the opening. You decrypt. Doesn't, doesn't stop us. It, it's really there just to keep you for, on the network from blocking and seeing that, hey, we're doing something with it. And uh, oh, you can't see. Lovely, right? Um, oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I forgot. Uh, the new version, Droid Dream Lite, and it was a modified version of Droid Dream. It was a little smaller, slightly different. It affected a bunch of uh, malware. And it also used, used a slightly, uh, I forget it was DES or AES. Well, as well, the standard algorithm, and it used it to hide uh, a couple of root exploits that were used in, in Droid Dream. Same identical exploits, just encrypted and hidden on before it dropped the disk. Um, other ways of bypassing protection, also important. Like, how do you how do you get further infected? We've got things like on Windows Mobile, they just disable the silent installation, so you don't even know you're being infected. Real simple. It's just like a registry setting, and you change it. Um, next step is root vulnerabilities. How do we stay on this? How do we make sure that we're uh, open up device and it can stay on? It's like having a rootkit on, uh, say on a, on a Unix box or Linux box. You're broken in. You say, how do I keep up, keep there? Very useful. And the root exploit gets you onto any 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 mobile device, pretty much, like on an Android Android device. Anyway, let's, let's go with those. Uh, so Droid Dream did it. Droid Dream Lite does it. it and, and and the funny thing is that the attackers aren't writing their own exploits. They're not even wasting their time writing their own exploits. They're writing malware that makes them money today. They don't have time to waste time looking for vulnerabilities, looking for spending time to write the exploits themselves. They don't they don't care. Uh, and then jailbreaking, kind of. Let's let's, let's talk about how to reduce security. Uh, has anyone seen that, that talk at uh, TourCon last year? Eric Monty of uh, Spider Labs. He did a talk, uh, a nice proof of concept where he, he reverse engineered uh, with the jailbreakme.com exploit to remove the warning messages from the exploit and and, and modify it so it's totally silent. So you visit a website, you get a silent drive-by download on a, on a jailbroken, uh, sorry, a regular iPhone. And then uh, you have uh, malware installed on your phone. And what was it installed? You installed a keylogger, and you tried it against a very popular uh, credit card processing application. It has a, it has a little uh, dongle you attach to your phone, and something in that range, and you slide it, and he was able to read the, read the uh, numbers. He could also modify that to send it to, to himself, to his own control server. Uh, and of course, this was on an unpatched phone. He had to unpatch it because Apple had patched it prior, but. The same rules apply to pretty much any, any, any O'Day exploit that gives you root access or gives you jailbreak access, which would give you access to the file system and helps you gain control of whatever you need. The, the, the concept really is if you have something that gives you that kind of access, very simple to do and port, make it malicious. Nothing new, nothing surprising, but yeah, actually you went and did it. Let's look at some real, real malware that's actually out there currently. 
Um, I guess this first one is uh, a simple SMS sending crouching. It pretends to be something else. What is it? Oh, okay. Uh, send, something that helps you send SMS easy, like has pad templates and patterns or whatever you want. Something interesting. How do you make money doing it? Same deal, sending SMS, profit, support profit SMS. And this one actually has a couple of choices. You pick three different uh, vendors based on your, your geographical location. Why? Because should the short codes that they send in the SMS to are also locked by a geographic region and you're not going to make money by sending to somewhere outside. So when we test it outside of, say, Russia or out of Kazakhstan or outside of Ukraine, we're not going to be able to test it on the network or test anything in that manner or know that anything is happening, meaning they're very locked geographically. Uh, something a little different, a little, little, little phishing exercise here. So uh, vContact is a very popular... Um, a uh, social networking platform in, in, in Russia, in Russian-speaking areas, uh, very similar to Facebook, and so it's like, okay, if you can get 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 those codes, um, <laughs> if you can get those uh, accounts, you can get uh, use them for blackmail. You can use them to gain more people, more contacts. Pretty much exploit it any any manner and whatnot. Uh, so what does this app do? It pretends to be a mobile uh, client for the uh, pretends to be a mobile client for for V Contact and say. So you log in, you try to log in, it gives you an error message, but and meanwhile in the background, it's emailing your, your, your credentials to the attacker. Real simple, blackmail users, resell the data, a number of different things you can do to make money. All right, that was straight to me. Uh, let's look at Symbian, which is actually quite complex. And generally, mostly, in, in, we're seeing this in China, not so much outside of that. These are the most uh, modern Symbian phones with the uh, data protection that, that wipes out pretty much all the worms that we had uh, three or four years ago. Uh, currently, these are much better. You need to have like uh, signed certificates, signed apps, and all, all, all things like that. Uh, well, actually, this is an older version. It's uh, Kija. It's uh, it was part of a multi-dropper, and it, it was designed to uh, fool the users into thinking, "Hey, we messed up your phone." They did mess up your phone. They installed a bunch of uh, rubbish on your phone, and it, it slowed your phone down. And he said, "Send me some money over QQ. QQ coins again are the money uh, for that instant messaging platform." And it was like, "Okay, send us some money." I don't think we uh, saw any confirmation that anyone who sent him money ever got their phones fixed or got any kind of fixed tool for it. But it was a pretty good technique. I mean. It tells you to send the money or else, right? Um, something else on, I mean, on Python, actually, just, just, just to show the point that scripting is not just limited to things like, like Java or whatnot, or simple Trojans aren't, aren't just Java. They'll do it with any easy, easy, really relaxing thing or simple thing you can pull up. Actually, I believe this is, uh, might have been Russian language one. Um, it allows you to send, uh, yeah, actually it was. Uh, once again, you'll see the type of variation. The previous one tried a little harder, tried to make you think there was a Chinese-based one. The Russian ones, they don't even have to. It's so easy for them, they're not wasting the energy trying to decide, okay, we're going to do something like this. That's a simple, simple thing. Pretend to be a chat client and takes your money. Simple. And back to the Chinese again. This is, a, once again, the more modern Symbian malware, Super Fairy, A and B. Um, a lot of details, a lot of malware. I got about 40 slides here of <laughs> various things. I have to remember the exact details of each. I have, if you look at the slides on, on, on the CD or the DVD that came with your, your, your uh, badge, uh, it lists reference to each of these malware. So you, you need further details that are there. But how they profit, uh, super fair, I think, was it added bookmarks to a certain smartphone phone forum. So you drive traffic towards, uh, you drive traffic towards, uh, a given website and you have people coming in and clicking and you have multiple infected units or users so they're uh, actually the real deal with having a bookmark on a phone like a Symbian phone or a phone that's not a smartphone that's about numbers or whatever for texting is that if you have a bookmark you're going to go to that website regardless of whether anything else is there because it's a pain in the butt to actually type in uh, blah, 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 50 long line character uh, URL on uh, with numbers difficult. So the bookmark is really a very popular way to get people to come to your site. And it's not so direct, once again, not so directly traceable like, uh, what do you call it, money things. Uh, all right. And we, we, we didn't see the second portion there in, in live. It was already disabled. The form was disabled. So instead, people were doing, what is it called, um, trying to get downloaded additional files. So it might have been malware, might have been spyware, could have been adware. Uh, another one, inspire.a. Uh, this was kind of needed. pretended to be uh, once again, this is not like the, the, the previous simple SMS version. This is one that's a little more complex. It's trying to pretend to be an actual helpful utility. Uh, and this is also kind of interesting how it does its phishing. Earlier I mentioned they were injecting uh, malware, uh, malware injecting SMS messages into your inbox or, or phishing. If you're phishing normally, you, you send like a text message to somebody and say, oh, here, here's a text message from uh, some number that looks like a normal user number or a number I never recognize, not the number from my bank. 
these guys say, okay, well, we know the number for the bank. We, we know how to put the messages into your inbox to, using the APIs to enter that into your, meaning very complex. We were in, in enough advanced developers to know that, hey, as an attacker, we can put that into, into your uh, mailbox. You see the, the, the text box, uh, sorry, text message with an address from your bank. You've seen it maybe before every time you log into your website or something, or a message, you can get a service message from your bank. It'll say, okay, here. Yeah, that looks familiar. It looks like it's from the bank. It's a real, real number, and it looks very uh, authentic. I mean, it's bypassed basically all the, all the protections you, you'd normally have as a normal user, like, how do I know this is real, right? It looks, it, it's, it passes the smell test, basically. It looks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's probably from my bank. And this one tells you, okay, people have tried logging into your account. Very sneaky technique. You're to lie, we're going to lock you out. Please log in. It's, it's that whole social engineering technique to get you to go and, and f get fished. Pretty useful and a good way to avoid detection. Uh, let's go on to the Android uh, malware, which quite a few. This is the Android game Nimi. This is the first one we mentioned. It was uh, kind of neat. A bunch of infected uh, local applications, and it required a lot of permissions. Very suspicious. And when you actually analyze it, we saw it has that backdoor functionality, so a toxic command and control server, and the attacker can do a bunch of things to you. Which is kind of nice. The question is, how do you use that to make money? Uh, you have a complicated malware. You have a way to talk back and forth to the, to the client, and you have a way to like, load software, install software, and do a bunch of things. So I can add additional software once I have my team working on something new and it has an attacker it's saying, okay, I already got something on their devices. How do we get more stuff on there without having to, have to go fool them and make infect other applications? And how do we do that? Same deal. You, and it also went after your contacts. So, okay, we have new targets to go after. We can do things like uh, give them the same messages and whatnot. And pretty much that was gaining me. Another one is uh, Steamy Screen Screen Script. I, I'm actually not sure how that's pronounced. Uh, usually we try to name these so we can at least pronounce them, but I mean, uh, it was common and pretty much all of us use it. Uh, this thing was stealing information that identified your phone specifically. We have various theories on that. Some people think, okay, they're using it to clone it. I don't think there's profit in cloning mo uh, smartphones as much as it's just stealing the money. If it takes you less time to steal the money, your attacker's probably going to go after that directly. They're not going to waste time trying to clone your phone and say, okay, we're going to use your phone and let me copy it so I can make phone calls. No, they're going to just take the money from you. Uh, this one's able to generate the uh, SMS message to your premium rate number and um, pretty much the same thing uh, Ganymede did without using the root exploits. So the root exploits are very nice uh, and they really only allow a few different things like, oh actually no, I'm thinking about Droid Dream. <laughs> That's coming up. Uh, or at least another version. Um, this, here's another one, a variant. This is the uh, calendar application that was infected and modified. Every time you load it up, it, it goes to January 1st and you have to move forward to get to whatever date, in, uh, 2011 I believe. You have to move forward to get to your current date at every time. So, but every time you move forward, it also, I think about four or five times, it triggers a payload and it starts sending out the pre made messages. And it also deletes messages so you don't know that you're being signed up for like a subscription service to a weather channel or a horoscope or who knows. Uh, very popular concept though. Uh, Android T-Cent A was uh, named after, an, uh, it's an app that's named after a variation of the main uh, company behind QQ, the Popular instant messaging client, so it pretends actually to be uh, software for that, uh, like a new client or something along those lines for that anti instant messaging platform. Uh, I, yeah, okay, there we go. The, the killing application security app, it actually goes after uh, default security applicants that are installed when you install your, your instant messaging client or if you have it installed already. So it's going after NFR, it's going after firewalls, it's going after whatever you have on your phone already. It's going after its enemies basically, which is a little bit, a lot more complex than we see normally. Not just a simple Java Trojan, but an Android Trojan is going after other people who are trying to clean them off the phones. The game usually is like with rootkits and, and, and basically things like of that nature. Whoever gets on the device first wins. So if you have security software and you're not protecting yourself, you're probably going to be hit by something like uh, Android T sent A. Uh, and once again, also does the whole premium rate sending thing. It makes money doing that. So it protects its business and it does its business. Uh, Kusin.ai. Uh, this one tried to be an MMS app. Uh, it really doesn't matter what they pretend to be because they're all basically trying to be something that they're not and getting up there and saying, okay, install us and we're good people. That's the social engineering portion. That's the, the easiest part of it. The hard part is that you've still already seen three or four that, uh, that are coming out of uh, China and are on Android and are basically looking at each other to like, make money off the same basic, well, okay, we've got about a million users or, or, or here and there and there's room, but they're still going after the same market. And just saying, okay, we have to worry about all these other characters. And also it does has a, has a command and control software and it can get rid of other software, which is nice. So for them, not for anyone else. Uh, another one nice new one is a Droid Kung Fu. Um, this was uh, discovered by, uh, I forget, but there at the end, I acknowledge him, I'll mention later. Uh, but uh, 
uh, this was the one that it was very similar to, to Droid Dream with the root exploits. It downloads them and, and gains access and is able to basically stay in areas outside of uh, the standard Android application locations. If anyone's seen the Google, um, I think the Droid Dream uh, malicious app cleaner from Google, uh, it was an Android market cleaner. Um, it had to use exploits on the, the same root exploits installed by the malware to clean the malware off the phone because by default it's not possible for us, uh, security software or Google or anyone else to delete uh, malware that's not stored in the standard Android application directories, right? I mean, that's where it would be the most important places. Uh, it does something similar for making money again, loading URLs in the browser, sending you to, to tra generating traffic towards their websites and telling them, hey, go over here and, and anytime, oh, actually, that's also used for loading uh, ad clicks, basically. Ad click is a URL you, you load it up, it's, it's going to be a post or whatever it's going to be, and it, it's generated as an individual ad click for, for millions of users. Um, oop, back one. <laughs> They're actually quite similar, a lot of these. Uh, there we go. Uh, PG app, another variation on a uh, family of things that invade uh, in install into uh, leg le excuse me legitimate applications and also make make money for people. Uh, okay, yeah. So this one signs up for server premium rate services and also adds a bookmarks. Uh, this one was a little bit more interesting. This is Top Plank A. You might have seen it named uh, Plankton or a few other things. Uh, if anyone's seen uh, at SummerCon, I think about two years ago, John Oberhai presented a. a uh, and a Twilight Preview app, which is very nice. It printed to be an app for um, the upcoming, I think it was Eclipse at that time. And it's like, okay, so you have a very popular movie coming out and you have an app that pretends to be that. That's a really great way to get people downloaded. So what did his app do? It downloaded uh, binary uh, exploits from his uh, server under his control. It was just a proof of concept, but it was hilarious that people actually downloaded it and were complaining. This app only has two pictures. One was the preview app in the Android market, and one was the one his app displays. Like, this is broken. You got about, a, I think, 100,000 downloads or something for this? Yeah, well, Top, uh, top Plank and Plankton is very similar. It downloads code, but it, instead of downloading binary apps, it actually downloads um, Android code. So it has a, a class loader to load the class files from the, the and a, and an additional APK download from the attacker server. Kind of new, and it also has a few more features like deleting history and deleting bookmarks. Where's the profit in that? You get rid of anything they've used, uh, used, used before, like say Google or, or Baidu or any search engine or whatnot, and instead you put in bookmarks for your own site. And you say, come to mine instead. Because they will, it's really easy, it's there and you delete uh, other bookmarks, even worse for them. And also it has a way of, sorry, if you've seen the UI talk by, uh, by uh, Trustwave, uh, like, I think it was yesterday, a little early in the end of the day, they were talking about how you can present messages to users or like it's a legitimate application. In the same way, top line displays messages and allows them to fish you and say, okay, do this or follow this action or do something very similar and send it out there. All right, um, another new app, uh, another Android malware is the base bridge, which, uh, does something similar to the previous two where it actually can goes after security software and AV software and I think one or two of them actually go after other malware. I don't have names for those at the moment. Um, how would they profit from something like this? Uh, same deal, sending SMS messages to a premium rate message and signing it up. Uh, in various places it's easy to get, get a, a premium rate account where you s provide a service for a certain amount of money. You might have seen ads on, on television and say, okay, sign up for this ringtone thing and then, or whatever it is, or to, and then on the small panel it'll be like, this is a repeating service, it repeats like for, uh, I don't know, every month you get billed like 10 bucks or whatever. Small amount of money here and then it's something works very similar everywhere else. Uh, then we have another one, J, uh, dot SMS hider. Uh, pretty much does the same thing, sending a premium messages and uh, installing additional malware. Not too complicated. And then we have some like Gold Dream. If anyone's seen the article that was, I think, was posted today saying that Gold Dream is, is a malware that, that uh, records your conversations and uh, records audio for, from, from an Android phone, not this malware. That, that's another one called Android Nickus, but I don't have a slide for that because it's not really a for profit malware. It's really more of spyware or whatnot, or malicious spyware, not, not the same thing, not for profit. Uh, Gold Dream was doing the same thing, intercepting, going after banking by intercepting mobile tans. So it's just like the, the Zeus in the mobile, the one where uh, you might have seen the Zeus Crimer toolkit that does phishing on, on, on the uh, PC side. They have a mobile portion that it sends the SMS messages. This is very similar and it, it'll intercept your SMS messages that have uh, uh, your authorization code. This is like those RSC tokens that change every 60 seconds. I, I heard from somebody uh, yesterday that it was maybe 30 seconds in the email, uh, sorry, SMS, a text message authorization code, which is about six digits, what small amount of numbers, lasts about 30 seconds. So long enough for a network to get it to you, like almost instantly. 
And, and depending on how small that window is, it also affects how, how the attacker goes after uh, your bank account. So if, if it's a short amount of time, they need to be on it at the same time you're on it, on, on the account. So they'll log in immediately. I talked to another guy who said, okay, he's monitoring financial uh, transactions. We don't get to see those as much. Um, but on the financial transaction side, you can see that how the malware does it versus how, how an average user would do it. If you log in as, as a bank account user and then you, you move, move, trans, uh, move money, you've got to go through the menu, you've got to click, 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 takes a few minutes. Uh, average time, maybe five minutes if you know exactly what you're doing. With the malware, they were seeing traffic patterns that look like, uh, this is PC malware, uh, about an, a login followed by about two seconds later a transfer. So a big difference and very easy to detect. Uh, there's a paper coming out on this in a couple of weeks uh, from the other researcher. Um, right, same deal sends premium rate messages, premium rate messages and adding new, new software, which is always bad because everything we're seeing here could have been variants installed by any of the previous ones coming before it. And, and it actually shows the pattern that people are actually trying to come after your money now. They're doing it on mobile devices and they're looking for ways to get to you easily. And, and once again, all they need to do if they have something that is complex is to be the first one on the phone before any protection, before anybody else helping out. So we tend to recommend look at the reviews if you can, see if there's something that's very popular, try to avoid as much the, the, the newer untested and applicants that have maybe five or ten downloads. If you can, some kind of reputational service, maybe somebody your friend knows something. Rather that before we have something to before somebody provides you that, or uh, try any of the other various people providing uh, security software on the markets now. Uh, another, another application, Hippo SMS, this was uh, another one inserted code into an application. A bit repetitive, some of these things that, you know, I mean, they're on the platforms. But the real key, the interesting part is, is how they make money and how they go after each other who, who are trying to make money. Other attackers are also trying to make money. That, that's a neat portion. But same deal, delete message so you have no idea you're signed up to a subscription service. Um, let's see what I've got left. Okay, this is the actual, uh, something more interesting. If another, this is a proof of concept, not a malware. This is Soundcomer. It was called uh, initially Soundminer. You might have seen the videos online. Um, this is basically a university project testing um, how do we create an app that uses very few permissions and is able to do, to, to do something like uh, taking your, your, your uh, sorry, your, your interactive voice response, uh, your, your basically your, 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 those menus you press one, press two, whatever, like the ones you call your credit card company. Okay, at, at some point at one of those calls, you're going to be typing in your credit card number or you're going to be saying your credit card number. And that's a pretty good target. Soundcomer goes after that. It's made of two pieces. Uh, one is the, uh, I think, the deliverer, it's called your deliverer, and then Soundcomer, the app. Um, so the first app part gathers audio from your microphone to, to overhear you either saying your credit card number or typing it in. It'll actually listen to TTMF when you type in your, your credit card number into the phone. You figure, wow, it's right there, they're sitting there, and it's not somebody next to me seeing my information, it's the phone itself going after me. Now, it doesn't need to do anything more than that to Soundcom app, but it does pass it to the second app, the deliverer, which does something interesting. It, it, we, it, it processes the sound uh, files because they know uh, process sound files and sends them back out to over, I forget what it was exactly, a, a very small amount of data, was it sound? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> um, how, do, how do they actually make money? They, they've got a fingerprint database for a number of, of uh, credit card companies, the interactive voice response uh, system, so they know, okay, this is the point where the user has hit the number and gone to like press one and two and they enter your credit card number stage, is okay, we'll hit that. We'll go after that location and say, okay, we'll just gather like say the 10 seconds it takes him or 30 seconds it takes him to say the number. And then we'll take that, put it on, on disk, and then scan that and, uh, or process that in that uh, specific sound clip for the digits. Now, their detection or their processing of sound was pretty good, and it was able to get about uh, of a sixteen digit number. Maybe they'll have a little, little trouble with like 15 digits, and like maybe the last number might be cut off or something, depending on how long they recorded. But since you've got 16 digits, and then there are only like nine digits they could, that, could, that could be, they, they could just route through them until they actually get your number. Very convenient, very neat, very few, per, few per permissions. Not as many as I believe as uh, they show in their video something about uh, a, a, a torch application or a sound application. Nothing like that. Very limited and they can still do damage. We have not seen this live in a real malware outside yet, but it looks very interesting. It looks like people could do this in the market or in, um, in the wild. And we might eventually see this uh, soon. All right, thank you. Um, all right, and uh, that's pretty much the rest of that application. We have references in the presentation for all of the malware here with actual technical details and a bit more data on, on the application, maybe a few images. 
and uh, we were references referencing the Soundcomer uh, presentation by by the uh, the, the team at uh, they, they presented it earlier. I forget exactly what university they're from because it was actually a bunch of people from a number of universities that got together and put this together. Very nice project. There's a video there, and uh, a few acknowledgments that people provide information on the uh, crimeware and the how people actually make money doing this. People actually test this against this. Uh, Peter Baum of um, I think it's O zero 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 O. I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce the name of his, uh, his thing. He did, 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 did he done a talk on. Uh, uh, from Russia with love.exe where, where we was an example of how r uh, Russian criminals were making money of PC malware and getting money from you. And I also talked to Billy Lee and then uh, Tom Pan Pan of anti white Labs. They probably learned more information on China. And once again, a team of Soundcomer and also uh, Dr. Zhang of uh, North Carolina State University who did, found a bunch of the samples in the latter part of the uh, presentation. Uh, another colleague, uh, Zhang Bu, helped me out with the Chinese um, uh, market a little bit more, and also Joey Zhu, if you've seen his talk on phishing yesterday, he was quite helpful clearing up a few details. Uh, were there any questions regarding any of these? Yeah. The the question is how how do the hackers get the, the uh, premium rate get paid when when they're doing the premium rate SMS attacks? Is that right? Yeah. So, so if they sign people up, are they running that service or is somebody else running that service? Then so you're asking if if do they run the premium rate service or are they getting it to a third party? A little bit of both, actually. Um, the premium rate service, I understand in Russia, it's easy, you're easy to get an anonymous premium rate number and have people dial that number and collect the money and then disappear afterwards. So it's a little easier in certain markets to do that. Oh, um, I understand we have to move to the QA room. It's uh, track three QA. I think it's across the hall. Ah, thank you.